Hey, welcome back. My name is Joel Duff, and if you didn't know, I'm a uh, professor of biology, as that's my real job. And yesterday, I gave a lecture. Uh, I've been giving a whole series of lectures in my current class on sort of the history and progression of thought in biology and in science in general. Uh, and we've been kind of just taking a romp through history and looking at uh, some of the most significant events in the development of ideas. Uh, and so mostly that is portrayed through the eyes of a number of individuals who made significant contributions. And you're looking at a slide taken right from my lecture yesterday on Carlos Linnaeus. Uh, in that class, I spent, I think, probably 10 or 11 minutes uh, talking about uh, Linnaeus. Um, and what I want to do here is I'm going to give you a flavor for, like, you know, what I do in lecture. Um, but this is going to be a little bit of an expanded version. I'm sure I'm going to end up talking for probably 20 or 30 minutes. So part of what I'm going to do in terms of expanding on my conversation about Carlos Linnaeus in class is I'm going to bring in an angle of how Carlos Linnaeus and his thoughts relate to the modern development of, we'll say, young earth creationism. Uh, and so I'm going to do that uh, through the use of a variety of different quotes uh, from Linnaeus's, mostly from his autobiographies, but also from his letters. All the images I'm going to show you are images from my lecture yesterday, uh, just with this sort of extension, uh, you know, additional conversation about the things that are mentioned here. So without further ado, let's look at Carl Linnaeus, the fixity of species, uh, his views of science, uh, his rather flamboyant nature, uh, his contributions to how we understand classification or how we classify organisms and just a general discussion of the diversity of life and um, ideas that people have come up with to explain the origins of that diversity. We've got all that coming up. Now, of course, before talking about Carl Linnaeus in class, I would have already and I already have over a series of multiple lectures talked about a number of important individuals and ideas. So we're, we're sort of taking this, as I said before, we're, we're taking a, a trip through the history of ideas, developing a, a number of different strands of thought. And mostly what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get students to understand that uh, revolutionary ideas uh, don't just appear out of nowhere. They're usually grounded on a number of questions that people have been struggling with or a number of different observations in the world that are maybe new, making people rethink what they knew before. And so we already talked about things like the, uh, the, the development of ideas about what fossils actually represent, going from not understanding that fossils represented formerly living things. Uh, and then that then brings up the idea of the discovery of deep time and so forth. And so the slide you're looking at here is something that I would have, uh, and I have used in class multiple times. It, it's uh, something I showed early on in this series of lectures. And it's sort of my basic history of ideas, uh, the main characters that I'm going to be discussing. So I'm trying to give the students some sort of perspective on like where we're at in history. Because, you know, when you're when we're learning about history, it's easy to kind of like get really confused about where in time you are. And there's also not an appreciation for how long it takes for some ideas to sort of develop and percolate over time. Um, we, we live in this uh, Internet age where ideas just sort of like boom, go across the world right away. And you can see fairly large revolutions in people's thinking over short periods of time. But in the past, in a disconnected environment, um, people are developing ideas and it takes a long time for those ideas not only to just percolate out and make their way like actually make their way physically through letters and uh, correspondences and, and travel, right? But also to then impact people's lives such that you start to, they start to think about those ideas and change their way of thinking. All right. So, so ideas are things that are, you know, hundreds of years, right? In, in development. And so I show this image and we talk generally about the scientific revolution, the Copernican evolution, revolution, you know, taking a hundred years really to fully develop. Uh, and and then then where do these different individuals, what are their primary roles in terms of influencing uh, and uh, pushing forward uh, this uh, development of thought? And so where does Carl Linnaeus fall in? Well, Carl Linnaeus right here falls in uh, just after 1700. 
Uh, so he's in the middle 1700s, which means he's in the middle of what I call the period of the discovery of deep time. And deep time would be the changing ideas of the world being a, um, a relatively young, having a relatively young origin uh, to the recognition that uh, there's a there are fossils that represent formerly living things. Those formerly living things are appear to be different than things that are alive today, which then starts the idea that the past was different than the present, that there were different ages of time. Uh, there is a recognition of what, what of the geological column, the nascent views of the geological column, a, recognize, a recognition, recognition that there are different eras of time. Uh, and so forth. And so Carl Linnaeus is growing up in that particular environment, but we're going to see that he's not necessarily influenced uh, very much at all by this whole deep time thing. And so you have to, you also have to remember that there are, when you're talking about these large ideas, things that sort of are readily accept, accepted today, if you were to go back in time, sure, you can find people in those times that are having revolutionary ideas, but they might be isolated in pockets or or in this, in this particular case, on, on a particular continent, right? Yeah. We're talking Western European thought generally. And that, ev but even within that, there are bubbles of different social networks that uh, don't share in those particular views. So there's a wide diversity of, of views during that time. And Carl Linnaeus kind of represents a sort of a pocket of what I would say he's living outside of his general age in terms of the Western um, European thought. He's, he's sort of a throwback to the 1600s uh, at this point. So with that as a basic introduction as to where Carl Linnaeus lies, let's talk about Carl Linnaeus and some of his ideas. All right, so here we have this dapper young looking fellow here, Carl Linnaeus, born in uh, 1707 and is often called the father of modern taxonomy. And if, if you've taken a biology class at all in high school, wherever, and you just learned about biology, you probably learned about Carl Linnaeus, right? He's just an easy character to kind of point to because, of course, his most famous contribution, the thing that we remember the most, or the thing that maybe you, the only thing maybe you were taught about Carl Linnaeus is that he is the father of taxonomy. He came up with the binomial nomenclature system, the whole idea that you have these Latin names for organisms, and they consist of two words, right? You have your... your um, your genus name, so like homo, uh, and your specific epithet, giving it specificity, you know, a particular species, homo sapiens, like human beings, or boa constrictor, or mus mus, which is the mouse, right? Or like one of my favorite plants to say, uh, liquid ambar striacaflua, all right, the sweet gum tree. All right. And so this is a system which he derived um, as a very simple way to uh, give a name to an organism and uh, put it into a grouping. And then, of course, he also created this uh, hierarchical system of grouping of, of organisms. So you have a species. A species is part of a genus, right? So uh, you could have a um, you have a dog like a or let's say a wolf, right? There's a particular species. So you have, yeah, let's say you have a wolf, right? Canis lupus, scientific name. Uh, but there are other canis, right? The genus. There are other things that are like wolves that are other species. Uh, and then wolves are also part of that genus is part of a family. And that family would be the canididae, all right? The, the canine family. And the canine family is part of a larger group of organisms that are in an order, the order which is carnivorae, which is the carnivores. And that also includes bears and um, uh, cats and so forth. Uh, and so you and so it's hierarchical in the sense you just keep putting these groups into larger and larger groups and eventually you get up to say like kingdoms like all animals there's a group called animals so he's um, he develops that hierarchical system and many of those names of the different hierarchies are the names that we use today so not only the binomial naming system but also the hierarchical system is his system now we would say that we use his system of classification. I don't particularly like, now if you'd heard my lecture, you would already know that uh, I've already talked about John Ray from the 1600s, and I would attribute to John Ray 
um, his description of what a species is as one of the first people to define a species. But also, I would have said in class that I believe that John Ray is really uh, more fundamentally sort of akin to how we classify today in terms of the, the way that we organize, the way that we look at organisms and we group them together uh, is based on his sort of method of the holistic parts of the organisms. Linnaeus had a very kind of artificial way of connecting organisms together into these different groups or identifying things, uh, which we wouldn't call natural. I'm not actually going to go into that. Uh, yes, let's. That's another part of a uh, of another lecture. Don't think it's worth going down that that avenue right here. So let's stick to like where, what I talked about uh, with Linnaeus. All right. So that's his most famous contribution. Now we're going to start with one quote from Linnaeus here to give you a little flavor of what Linnaeus was like. He wrote multiple autobiographies, and in those autobiographies about himself, he refers to himself as Linnaeus. Right, and he refers to himself in the third person. Um, and here's a here's a clever little quote from one of those. God created Linnaeus organized. And I think that's a, a nice representation of how he felt about his role, all right, his purpose in life. Right. Um, he's attributing all the world around us to God's creation. He's very much a theist, uh, a biblical liberal literalist, and uh, he believes that God has created all the different kinds of organisms, as we're going to see. And so if God created this world. Uh, one of the jobs of human beings and one of the tasks we're given, right? I mean, you can see that Adam is given the responsibility to do what? Name the animals, right? And so Linnaeus is taking that to another level now. He's, he's, he's giving them a, uh, a method of naming that, that is a method of like actual, like giving the name itself and, and a memorable name. And then, but also organizing, all right, organizing the world around us into hierarchical structures and, and placing and giving it order. Just like God in his creation, in the creation narrative in the first six days, he's, he's outlining a chaotic, right, world, a world without form, a, you know, it's formless and void. And he takes that and he shapes it into and makes all these different organized things that make a habitat for human beings. And so he is organizing the world. Linnaeus sees himself as doing that creative capacity that is given to man as God, God made and in God's image. Part of that image bearing aspect is the ability to organize and to, um, to classify, right? And so God creates Linnaeus organized, right? Linnaeus organized the world for God and placed the biological organisms into nature. Actually, it's not just biology. Uh, Linnaeus was also very much a uh, natural theologian of the time in the sense that he wasn't just interested in plants or just in animals, but also in rocks and minerals and so forth. And so devised also ways to classify those, which, which are not things that we think of today because we do have a different system for that. So he's not the father of mineralogy, say. Okay, let's get to it. But all I have here for you is a series of quotes, but I'm going to expand upon what I think the significance of these quotes are in terms of the thinking of the day. All right. And this is what I'm doing with my classes. I'm, I'm saying, look, this is here's the way people think. This is the way this is if you had lived right in the early 1700s you would probably think very much like Linnaeus is thinking here. And so this is the type of environment that later, 100 years later, you have other people developing and, and, and starting to question some of these particular ideas because of observations they make in the world. All right, so let's get to it. Some quotes. The first step in wisdom is to know the things themselves. This notion consists of having a true idea of the objects. Objects are distinguished and known by classifying them methodically and giving them appropriate names. Therefore, classification and name giving will always be the foundation of our science. And when he's talking about our science here, he's talking about sort of he's 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 coming into the world at, at a time in which the the method of science has sort of been established. All right. Um, if we go, let me go back here real quick. 
if we go here and we see the scientific revolution, which many people identify as sort of ending or completing itself uh, in 1687 when Isaac Newton publishes Principia, uh, which is a formulation of all the laws of motion, universal gravitation, all right? Um, but also it is a representation of sort of the scientific method, an explanation for how we go about um, discovery and testing ideas and so forth. All right, so Linnaeus comes into that sort of world and in that world, what is one of the most foundational things that is needed? You need to, uh, you need to have a true idea of an object's nature, right? And you need to be able to distinguish one object from another in order to be able to talk about it. Um, how do I know that this particular thing is a different species than another? I have to identify characteristics that are true, true to the nature of that particular thing. And I'm going to identify identifying characteristics that are unique to different objects, in this case the object being maybe individuals or populations, and therefore identifying the important characteristics that make them different, allowing me to organize or classify the world. This is one species, this is another, or this is a subspecies. It's not different enough uh, from other individuals to call it a completely separate species because I've identified unique characteristics which are true to those particular objects and therefore not different enough to call a different species. So he, he views classification. Now classification is going to be the things that you uh, measure, all right, of any particular object in the world. If, if whatever science you're doing, whatever you're measuring, whatever you're, you, whatever you're looking at, you have to have words, right, to describe the characteristics you're seeing. Or if you're doing anatomy, you have words for each of the individual bones. You classify the bones, right? And for an anatomist or for a physician then to be able to say, I, I, I know what this particular thing is when I open somebody up, you have to understand particular characteristics that are true to the objects themselves to be able to know I'm looking at this versus that. And when somebody says something and also the whole good thing about scientific classification with respect to like species names and the binomial naming system is when somebody says striaca flua, uh, liquid ambar striaca fluid, right? If you are all familiar with the scientific naming of things, you would know like that's sweet gum tree and that's been defined because there's a publication somewhere that defines what the characteristics are, the true nature of the objects of a sweet gum tree are, and they're associated then with that particular name. So if I just say that name, you then know a whole bunch more about that particular tree. Or even if you don't know it off the top of your head, you can go look it up and find out, ah, these are all the characteristics of a liquid ambar striaca fluid. Um, you know, in, in a way, what he's doing here and what I talk about in class is, you know, we, we think of, of math as also being called the queen of the sciences, right? That, that all science really, you know, underlying it all, you have to have this mathematic reality. You know, math is at, at, the, at the basis of, of, of much of science. Um, and Linnaeus here is, is saying, you know, it's, he views it as classification and object identification and organizing things such that you can have communication from one person to another and know what the heck anyone else is talking about, have a common language, um, that is at the core or the foundation uh, of science. And that's essentially what I'm doing with students, right? I'm, I'm saying uh, I, I'm, you know, we are training students. We are giving them a repertoire of terms of individual pieces of information that are the core pieces of information they have to have in order to have communication to be able to talk about a subject. Now, that's not all we want them to, now that's what a lot of people think science is. You know, when they take it in school, they just remember it's like I had to memorize a bunch of terms. Or I had to I'd learn a lot of names of things, of parts of organisms, say, or something like that. And you can get bogged down in that. With, but in, without realizing that that's a core thing you kind of have to know in order to begin to think about general principles and concepts and, and start to connect ideas, you can't really develop those ideas without first having the base of knowledge, the basic facts, all right, the true ideas, the true pieces of information about those objects in order to then start thinking about the connections between things and how things work, and then start to ask bigger questions about why and origins and so forth. Those are all going to be built on a foundation of having 
a common language uh, of truth, right? True things that we all can agree uh, upon at a, at a basic level. We can disagree about theories about uh, how things are connected and why they are the way they are, but we shouldn't be able to, we shouldn't have to disagree about the basics. And so Carl Linnaeus is there, I'm building the foundation of, of science for which is something we could all stand on as being true. Um, okay, uh, yeah, that kind of goes with the next quote. In natural science, the principles of truth ought to be confirm, co confirmed by observation. Right. We you need to be able to see something uh, as observably true. You need to be able to have like you need to have evidence. Right. Is, is sort of what he's saying. You need evidence for the thing that you're saying is true. All right. Let's get this is we're going to get a little more into the, the his philosophy and then we can start comparing that with some ideas that are in the present. Um, natural bodies are divided into three kingdoms of nature. Now, remember, he's the one that sort of has come up with the idea of kingdoms, all right? You have uh, plants and you have animals, the, the plant kingdom and the animalia, the animal kingdom, and then you have all these different groups underneath them. He doesn't really know that much about bacteria and, and, and other words, but th there is some microbiology at the time. The microscope is coming into being and so forth, and but still people are just shoving everything into it. You're either a plant or an animal, like a green alga is a plant. Uh, anything that moves as an animal, as we'll see here. What are the three kingdoms? Well, you have the mineral kingdom. All right, so you have minerals or inanimate things, but they can be classified too because they are, you know, different minerals have different characteristics. And if you know the true nature of those objects, then you can group them together. Uh, and you, you can even create hierarchical groups of, of minerals too, uh, in some sense. You have the mineral, the vegetable plants, and you have the animal kingdoms. And what is the primary difference between those? Minerals can grow. I don't even think you have to think of like a salt crystal. All right, you can you can watch a salt crystal grow from dried up from drying seawater, and that would be a mineral of of sodium chloride. Plants grow and live, so they have a form of life. And we could do a whole long video just on what makes up something that's alive. But nonetheless, everyone has an intuitive feeling for plants are alive versus minerals. And then you have animals. Animals can grow, all right, just like plants can grow, and they're alive. Um, but animals also have feelings, all right, uh, or they have, they can, in, in, in his world, we recognize that plants interact with their environment and can adapt right today. But in, in their world, animals are able to respond to the environment, right? They can get up and move and change their conditions and so forth, right? Uh, and ultimately have, uh, some of them have, they, that feeling is a response, all right? Don't just think of feelings like I feel sad or happy or something like that. Okay, next up. Um, of what use are the great number of petrifications? Hmm, petrifications, he's talking about, that. That's, a, that's the old name for fossils. Of different species, shape and form, which are dug up by naturalists. So what use are these fossils that uh, we're now starting to say are like, remnants of ancient things and people are getting all crazy about because in the late 1600s early 1700s there's a lot of fossil collecting going on perhaps the collection of such specimens is sheer vanity and inquisitiveness right <laughs> yeah you know yeah it's just something you're excited about and you like to show them off and it's because really what happened is you know, rich people hire people to get fossils for them or buy them and they put them in their collections their curiosity cabinets and they they have their friends over and, you know, it's like, what are you going to do? You played your harpsichord and you you uh, you talk some philosophy and you talked about some local politics. And it's like, well, what other type of entertainment do you have? Bring out. Let's go back to the room and check out my curiosity cabinet, my unique, interesting things that nobody else has. I've got the most interesting shark's tooth, right? Uh, rock, which no one else has. All right, and so that's just vanity. Uh, it's just like maybe you're maybe you're interested, maybe you're curious, but is it really of great worldly importance? Well, I do not presume to say, but we find in our mountains, 
the rarest animals, shells, mussels, corals, and corals embalmed in stone. So he recognizes, like, you know, in our mountains, way above sea level, we find shells, corals, mussels embalmed in stone, somehow preserved in stone. Living specimens of which are now being sought in vain throughout Europe. The stones alone whisper in the midst of general silence. Okay, this is a very, um, I find this a very intriguing take on fossils that I think does suggest that Linnaeus is a, a little bit curious himself and a little uh, not sure exactly how to explain fossils, which does mean he fits into the early 1700s, late 1600s environment in which fossils are, they are a curiosity, uh, but they are now being accepted as things that had been living in the past that are somehow embalmed in rock. The question is, how did they become embalmed in rock? How did, how did they enter into that rock? And this left a lot of people scratching their heads. But it was a fact, right? We've already seen that these are observations. These are things that, like Linnaeus would say, that these are actual things we observe in nature. I see these things and I, I, can, I can measure their characteristics. And so, and I can even classify them, right? I'm, I'm tempted because I'm God's classifier, right? I, I'm here in this world to classify everything God has made. And what is one thing that God has made? He made fossils, right? Because he made the ground, right? He, he shaped the earth. And these, rock, these fossils are in these rocks. Therefore, he feels a compulsion to also classify them. But what exactly is their nature? How do they relate to things alive today? Because, oh, look at here. There's a little hint here of a problem. We find them in the mountains, but we are looking for living specimens, which are now being, uh, well, I'm sorry, living specimens of which, in other words, of those fossils, we're looking for living specimens, but we're looking for them so far in vain. We've looked all over Europe. So here we're finding these fossils in Europe. We're looking all over Europe and we can't find the exact same species, the exact same, because he knows what a species is. He knows about the hierarchical classification. See, we found these weird animals that, you know, like, like, yeah, that is some kind of bear, but it's not a bear anyone's seen anywhere. It's, uh, you know, this cave bear, it's, it's, it's larger and it has some other different pieces of anatomy. It's anatomical structure is different enough that he, as a taxonomist, right, as a classifier, would have to look at and go, hmm, this just does not fit the things that are alive today. But God made everything that's alive today, and he must have, you know, so what is this thing? You know, what, what are these things? Maybe they're thinking, and what everyone thought was, well, they represent things that are living. Well, then we should be able to go out and find them, right? If they're, if they're living, I mean, if there's something that were alive, there's probably, there must be relatives alive today. The other thing that was part of my lecture is we talk about the first beginnings of ideas about extinction. You see, in the late 1600s, I mean, no one's going to think that something that God made has gone extinct. I mean, God made, some, you know, the different organisms and to allow something as part of his creation to go extinct was kind of an anathema at the time, right? It just nobody was aware at all of the idea that uh, would have thought that organisms that were alive in the past might not still be alive. So the assumption is they're somewhere. So if you see something in the ground and you think that must have been something that was alive, you, you have to find it somewhere. It has to exist, right? He's he's in the, that's what I like about these quotes. He, he's recognizing in his community, scientific community, that people are running around in vain trying to find things that they think must be alive. And I believe that Linnaeus also would have definitely believed that they should be alive as well. Um, now, here's the, here's the excuse that was used in the late 1600s, but it becomes more and more difficult to use as you get into the late 1700s. A hundred years later, you can't use the same excuse. The excuse was this. Well, they're not in Europe, but maybe they were in Europe, but the world has gone through transformations of some type, or, and the organisms no longer live here, but they live somewhere else, right? We know there's other lands. Right? Maybe they live in South Africa or... 
maybe they live in this new world we just found you know it's like there's a whole new world over there and we're getting reports that there's a lot of different types of organisms over there that are very different than the ones that live here in europe and so maybe that's where they are you know so in other words local extinction right they were here they're not here but they still are alive on the earth they're still they're still living kinds of organisms that God has made and is preserving, you know, throughout time. Okay, we're really building up to the big ideas now. There are as many species as the infinite being created diverse forms in the beginning, which, following the laws of generation, copying uh, uh, um, heredity, all right, making more copies of one's cells, reproduction, produced many others but always similar to them. Therefore, there are as many species as we have different structures before us today. All right, I'm not exactly sure the full interpretation of, of Linnaeus's meaning here uh, for all of this, but we can get through several parts of it. There are as many species in, as the infinite being created diverse forms in the beginning. Okay, there are a lot of species in the world. Linnaeus should know he's been naming a lot of them. I mean, he's named tens of thousands of organisms at this time. He, um, he recognizes that they're all made by the infinite being, the, the, the creator God. And God created a diversity of forms, right? You look, around, look, there's an incredible diversity of living things. And when did he create all those? He created all those in the beginning, right? And for, for uh, Linnaeus, in the beginning is going to be on those different days of creation. And he certainly would have believed that those days of creation were like 24 hour days. Uh, and so therefore, and, and only about 6,000 years ago. All right, so, which following the law of generation produced many others. Mm, now this is a little tricky here. This is uh, because if you read this a certain way, there is many species and then they reproduce and they produced many others, but always very similar to them. So does he mean produced many others by reproduction, many others being many other species? I think what he does is he describes them as varieties uh, of organisms. Like you can see there's a whole bunch of variety of life. And we're gonna see this in the next quote. It'll make it a little more clear. Um, so yes, he, he says like, okay, yes, God created all the things at the beginning, but there's obviously variation within species. And when you, things reproduce, they don't produce things exact that look exactly like each other. They're not cloning each other. No organism is able to clone itself. There's always variation. And so, but that variation is always similar, right? Every organism that reproduces produces something very similar to itself. He's actually bulking against the idea that that actually existed at the time. Again, you haven't seen the rest of my series, but there are others that are starting to suggest that uh, that uh, you know life comes from non-life, spontaneous generation, and that things are popping up, uh, and that things might uh, you know change in certain ways, not necessarily via what we would consider an evolutionary process, but nonetheless, this idea that organisms were different in the past, this is where fo the fossil thing comes in, that organisms were fossil different in the past and now there's different ones in the present and somehow they've, they've changed. And he's gonna emphasize that, yes, you can have, there's variation, but it's always very similar. So really there is just as many species as there are different structures before us today. You know, that God created all the different structures possible uh, and there's just little variations within them. All right, again, that quote is a little bit, it's, it's kind of interesting because you could read it in a number of different ways. You could read into it almost the acceptance of what say modern young earth creationists do, which is um, allowing for maybe speciation um because that's just changes within kinds um, but from many other writings it appears that Linnaeus thought that God created species all right um, or if at least species like wolves that may have diversified into maybe dogs right so a fair amount of diversification but not that much okay last quote I promise but it's a biggie all the species recognized by botanists came forth from the almighty creator's hand. And the number of these is now and always will be exactly the same. Okay? All the species 
And you know what he means by species because he's the definer of species in the sense of naming them. Recognized by botanists, he's a botanist at heart. Comes forth from the Almighty Creator's hand. God made them. God made the individual species. And the number of things that he made is now, today, the same and always will be exactly the same. So whatever we see today in the world around us as species is the same as what God had created at the beginning. There aren't more species today. There aren't fewer species today. Aha! Therefore, there can't be extinction. Hence, before you got these fossils, which look nothing like anything that we've seen alive today, but they must be somewhere because they couldn't have gotten extinct. So this is a curi this is a curiosity at the time. You're like this is something that made people like kind of crazy, because if species can't go extinct, then they all have to live today. That means they should be findable. But I digress. All species recognized by botanists came forth from the Almighty's hand. While every day new and different flora species arise from the true species, so-called by botanist. All right, so we have the true species, and we also have new species that are arising by different florists, and what he calls flora species. What the heck is he talking about there? He's talking about the obvious observation in the world of the day, because it was pretty popular at the time, just like it is today, of botanists who were learning to make varieties, right? Look at all the different types of tulips. Look at all the different types of roses. Look at all the different types of crocuses. Look at all the different types of varieties of apples. Look at all the varieties. And how were those created? By picking out specific characteristics and propagating those particular characteristics until they had kind of a purebred line. Uh, he could have very well have pointed to domesticated dogs, right? You know, you have, here's a, here are Dalmatians, and here are, are Dutchians, and here's all these different different breeds, right? And But he'd recognize that those are new breeds that were made by, in this case, dog breeders, but in the case of botanists, new varieties of plants that were made by us, right? So God made the original true species, and we have manipulated the true species and, and formed varieties from it. But now look at the look at the last part of this. And when they have arisen, they finally revert to their original forms or to the original forms. The original form is the original form God made them in. So you can think of this as the wild type. You can think of this the best way is domesticated dogs. You can think of it as you have a wolf. You can take that wolf and you can parse out different features and you can make groups of, of individuals that have specific characteristics of, that, are, that are a subset of the wolf. And we call those breeds, right? And so you can have a bunch of different breeds. And so you are making, you are making new what you might call new species because they're so different from one another. However, he would recognize that if you just let a whole bunch of dog breeds just intermingle and regenerate, right? When they regenerate, cross with each other, they're going to spit out something that is a whole lot more wolf-like than the individual breeds, right? They're going to mix back together. And that's what he's referring to here is they, they're finally going to revert back to their original form. So it's like saying, you can take what God made and, and, and gave you, and you can like pull it apart into little pieces and chunks and manipulate it and create different forms from that. But ultimately, they're going to meld back together and they're going to continue to exist as that same true species uh, at some point. You can't truly take things, separate them and turn them into brand new things that will never that, that can't meld back together. So he's rec recognizing a sort of reproductive uh, boundaries uh, here. Accordingly, to the former have been assigned by nature fixed limits. The former. What's the former? The true species. The true species that God made have fixed limits. Nature says you can't go beyond this point. You cannot change beyond some, some, some level, right? You can't change yourself into something else. All right. They cannot go beyond that point. 
while the latter display without end the infinite sport of nature. And you see, what, what, what Linnaeus is faced with and what all really biologists are faced with in the 1700s is the obvious observation that we can manipulate organisms and that organisms have variety, right? Even in nature, even the original forms that God created have tremendous diversity. And so he's already acknowledged that they can reproduce and they can form new combinations of that variety, right? They're not, they're not, they don't make carbon copies of each other. There is variation. There's always variation. You could recognize, even as other people did in his time, that um, particular groups of individuals that are moved to new environments will adapt, not using that word, but they're adapting to that various local climate and changing in such ways. Uh, and that change can be quite dramatic. So this is what he and other biologists know about. Um, and they need an explanation for that. Like, and so this is why they're, they're, they're saying there's a fixed boundary. Now, defining what that boundary is is difficult. And this is where this relates to young Earth creationists today. Now, young Earth creationists don't think that species have a fixed boundary in the sense that species can't change into something that's a different species because almost all young earth creationists accept the fact that you know like all the 35 different kinds of canines all were originally one kind of canine and then they have reproduced and as they've reproduced and moved into new environments they have changed such that they become so different that they're identifiable as separate species and many times they're even incompatible with one another so they have they have arrived at an, a distinguishing themselves enough that we would call them different species. This is something that uh, Linnaeus wouldn't accept at his time. I should say that there are people in the 1700s that are probably a little more liberal on this side and probably accept a little bit more change than he does. However, everybody would say that there was some fixed limit somewhere. It's just, where do you define where the fixed limit is? And that's exactly where young earth creationists are today. They also believe there's a fixed limit because they don't believe in common ancestry of all living things. So they believe that God made all the original kinds. So that's similar to Linnaeus, but they have a different definition of the kind. The kind can be a much broader group. And within that broader group, you can have a tremendous amount of variation, push and pull. In other words, in other words the limit, the fixed boundaries are far broader for the modern creationist versus a Linnaean all right, uh, in his time. And so that's something where that's something that's very different from the past to the present. And that's because we've we've observed more of the world. And so Linnaeus is giving in to the fact that organisms can change because obviously they do change. Uh, and obviously we've been able to manipulate organisms and create new varieties of organisms. So it's obvious that organisms shape shift to some sense. Uh, and so he's accommodating that just like young earth creationists accommodate that there's even more change possible than Linnaeus thought there was possible at the time. Um, all right, so I guess putting all that together, you have a world in which Linnaeus is saying, I'm organizing, and he's coming up with all these different groups. And interestingly, for his groups, though, he's saying God made each individual type of canine. All right. Now, I don't really know what he would say about I. I don't think he knew that domesticated dogs were derived from wolves. You know, we have so much evidence that uh, domesticated dogs are really just a variety of a wolf, of a wild wolf. That's the 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 wolf is the wild type of organism, right? From which domesticated dogs are derived, uh, have been domesticated from. But. I'm not sure Linnaeus would have known that at the time. I'm not sure how much they would have recognized the similarities of uh, domesticated dogs with wolves. Um, and so he might have believed that God made even a domesticated type of dog. I don't know what the original wild type of domesticated dog would have looked like and been. But nonetheless, he might have made a domesticated dog from which we've sort of made all the other domesticated varieties. Um, but nonetheless, he is in a time in which um, he's recognizing that there are many different uh, species. And he's saying each one of them God made separately.
Now he's willing to group them together. He's like, all these different species have some similarities. And because they have similarities, for convenience sake, we can group these into groups of things that have similar characteristics for practical reasons, right? Because in order to do science, if I say that something is in a particular group, you will have an idea of the general characteristics that other members of that group have. Is he implying that those members of the group have a common ancestor? No, not at all. Canis lupus, Canis, domestic, uh, Canis latrans, the uh, coyote. Uh, those are two different species. God made them separately. They have no common ancestry with each other. They have common features. And therefore, I will group those together for the convenience of being able to understand characteristics of both. And then I will put them into a larger group, which is all the canines, which include foxes and African wild dogs and so forth, because they also share those characteristics. Now, later, of course, what's going to happen in the 1800s is people are going to look at those different groups that Linnaeus has come up with. And they're going to say the reason these are natural groups is not necessarily because God made them to look similar because, he, because they're all commonly made from a common body plan, say, but they're not actually connected. People just looked at that and said the reason they're all similar is because maybe they're actually connected by a common ancestor kind of like all domesticated dogs have similarities because they all have a common ancestor. Um, I mean, Linnaeus would have accepted that, um, but he wouldn't accept that the different species have a common ancestor. But you can see where the extension comes in. You see how once you start to have variation and you have adaptation and you have changes that you can see are being made by individuals, by people, and that even out there in nature, you can see that these changes are occurring in different environments. Of course, you're going to start asking questions about, well, maybe uh, maybe wolves and coyotes are, maybe they're actually the same thing, and they're just they're just variations on a common of a common ancestor. And then maybe all canines are a common ancestor. Well, that's what that's what Ken Ham and Young Earth Creationists do today. They just lump all those together, and they say like, if you just go back in time, you'll find they have a common ancestor. And by the way, this helps young earth creationists understand why the fossils, why there are fossils for which there is nothing alive today. Well, they also believe in extinction, but also if things have changed over time, their descendants would look different than the ones present today. But those descendants, they're no longer around in terms of like ones that look like them. Whereas Linnaeus didn't have that. You know, he's like, uh, you know, for, for them, the fossils of the day were things that looked different, but they couldn't have been ancestors of the, of the living things. They had to represent actual things that were also alive and had those particular unique characteristics because for Linnaeus, he's going to name those fossils. I mean, he doesn't, I don't think he actually does this, but if he were to have to name them, he would name them different names as different species, in which case he's acknowledging that God made them separately unique from each other. Right, so he's lay, he's right at the he, he's sitting right at the boundary between these ideas of wow the world is you know I would say most people around him are believing the world is old now right you know thousands of tens of thousands of years if not hundreds of thousands of years old and now there's these new ideas of like wait a second it's not just that you know it was like a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago that things were different that these fossils were made 4,000 years ago. What if these fossils were made 100,000 years ago? You know, that could those organisms still be around today? Maybe they're extinct, right? So the idea of extinction, the idea of one organism replacing another with adaptations over time, accumulating, those are all things that are happening. And in some ways, what we're seeing here is Linnaeus is kind of balking at some of those ideas, but he doesn't really have answers other than just saying that's the way it is right there are fixed limits but he's not able to say what the limits are like what does limit an organism from changing like how does how does nature stop it right especially when we can see that we can make amazing changes to organisms all right so i don't know how to stop this because in my lecture of course uh the next slide is about william paley and we talk about the watchmaker analogy and we talk about intelligent design. And uh, because one of the answers to Linnaeus's problem, uh, which which comes later in the late 1700s, is William Paley, who uh, 
who devises um, uh, a really powerful argument uh, in his day and, and even into the present that um, that seeing design in things uh, is evidence of the designer, right? Uh, and so he really, the detail of life and nature for him is that all these things had to have a designer. And that still fits with the idea of every single species being designed and made separately from one another. But even those ideas become, uh, you have to intersect at some point with, okay, so there's specific design for an individual, but individuals are part of a population that has variation. Where did the variation come from? Like, where do the variations come from? Because not everything is designed exactly the same. So you have to have flexibility in design. It can't be completely rigid because no organism exactly copies its design 100%. There's always variation. And so the recognition of variation leads one to be forced to come up with why such a dynamic system exists rather than a static system. And Linnaeus is living more in a static system world in which he's trying to accommodate some of this variation, accommodate some of the dynamic nature of the changes of organisms. But at the point, at this point, he can roughly say, because he doesn't really understand population biology, right? He doesn't, he hasn't really observed probably wild populations and observed changes in populations in different places in the world of the same species. So he doesn't really have any concept of that kind of adaption. He only can see that as like in the farmyard, right? And, and in the botanist laboratory, uh, making new varieties. And you can always say that, well, that's a designer, right? That's man that's manipulating God's creation. And by manipulating God's creation, um, but it's only, it's futile, right? He's essentially saying it's futile because eventually what's going to happen is those things are just going to mix back and become the wild type again, All right? So he, he's able to sort of justify or, or, or hand wave away um, some of the other variation in the natural world. And maybe hand wave away is the wrong idea. But he's just not aware of that much variation. And so it's over the next hundred years that this sort of thinking becomes untenable and you have to have additional ways of explaining the diversity of life. And like I said, today we have obviously evolutionary biology because Darwin comes along 100, uh, 150 years later and provides a possible mechanism and, and an idea of common ancestry to explain the hierarchical nesting patterns that Linnaeus uh, observed in the world, right? That's an observation that no one can take away from Linnaeus that, that there is hierarchical uh, classify there are hierarchical patterns of organization that can be made that are that seem very reasonable and that many individuals looking at the world can independently come up with the same hierarchies that suggests a um, a structure right that structures an organized structure to the world's uh, diversity um, and of course. Darwin's going to come up with a, an alternative explanation for the reason why there is an observed hierarchy of, of structure, uh, of organization. And today's young earth creationists are not the direct intellectual uh, descendants of somebody like Linnaeus. They're really a restart of, of a mixture of old ideas but also they are an adaptation to the changes of the history of thought. Um, you know, because they accept the nature of fossils, they accept extinction, they accept all kinds of things that were unknown in the world of the 1600s. Um, and so young earth creationists wouldn't be young earth creationists in the sense that they are now or have the ideas they'd have now if they lived in the 1600s. They have distinctly modern thoughts because they are a reflection of what we've learned about the world over the last 300 years. But they're an attempt to try to um, maintain a distinction or maintain um, a similar view of God's uh, involvement in the original creation of kinds, but they've changed the, you know, what a kind is, how diverse it can be, how adaptable it is, um, and how much it's changed over time, and you got the whole bottleneck of the flood and all those other things. All right, I think we can uh, quit there. Um, like I said, this is just uh, a couple slides from a series. You know, I would have gone through all the, I did read these quotes to my class and I gave them some basic ideas of like essential 
things that Linnaeus is expressing here that represent his thoughts of his day. And then we're going to use that to contrast, like, why do people think other things now? Well, what I'm really doing is building up the case for um, what are some of the things that people observed in the world and discovered about the world, right, through this new thing called science, right, in the late 1600s, that then made people reevaluate and rethink things like, did organisms go extinct? Were there organisms in the past that were very different today? And then how do you explain a whole different ecology, a whole different ecosystem in the past versus an ecosystem being present in today that's very different? Where do you, how do you explain those things? Young Earth creationists have uh, recognized those differences and they've recognized the geological column and the fact that there's a vast number of fossils uh, from times past. And they've accommodated that through the use of Noah's flood, which that wouldn't have been done in the 1600s. No one, they knew about Noah's flood. They believed in Noah's flood. They didn't believe it actually created all the, 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 the massive layers of rocks. And they didn't believe they created all the fossils since they didn't really think fossils needed that type of explanation. They're just things God made. Um, so we see that these long time building changes in our understanding of the world have caused everybody who lives today to um, have different answers for the origins of diversity and the origins of life uh, on this earth. Okay, let's leave it there. Maybe I'll pick up uh, a couple other slides uh, from my lecture and, and make them into uh, little mini lectures for you in the future. Thanks for listening. Uh, we'll see you later. Bye-bye.